Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks to the wonders of technology, we're able to bring you three people who otherwise wouldn't be able to participate in the conference. Um, as, as the NCRC audience knows earlier this year, the three banking regulators uh, proposed an NPR to modernize CRA. We have two of the three principals uh, with us here today, virtually, uh, Vice Chairman Lael Brainerd of the Federal Reserve and Acting Comptroller Michael Sue, Comptroller of the Currency. I um, want to thank both of you for being here today. I know it wasn't possible to be in person, but really appreciate um, the effort to be here. Uh, and, and I think you need no further introduction to our audience. So I will dive um, right in. Uh, Vice Chairman Brainerd, as, as you engaged in the CRA process, you heard from a great many stakeholders, um, from your own staff, the problems with CRA. Um, you know, what was the problem we were trying to address? What was really important to get right? And what did you hear along the way um, that needed fixing? Well, uh... First of all, thank you, Jesse, for uh, holding this conversation and thanks to uh, NCRC for all of the engagement um, of your members and your organization. One of the things that we heard uh, for a long time from some of the members of your organization, from community groups generally and from banks, uh, that more and more banking services are taking place far from branches via mobile, via online. And that means less and less of the activity of banks is taken into consideration for the existing CRA rule, which of course it was written more than 25 years ago. So, uh, so not a surprise. So the proposal will scope in a lot more activity that will be within the umbrella of CRA evaluation, including Importantly, areas where there are concentrations of retail lending activity outside of a branch and areas that are just broadly underserved uh, by banks. And I think the proposal uh, tries to make sure that the CRA role is, rule is fit for purpose for the banking system of the future, uh, which in effect will make it more of an investment in the future of these uh, communities and create uh, opportunity for the way that financial services are delivered today rather than the way they were delivered 25 years ago. Thank you. And uh, Comptroller Sue, same question uh, from your perspective. Um, you know, what were the problems we were trying to solve here? Um, so uh, to echo uh, Lael, you know, thank, thanks for having uh, me and, and, for, and for this conference. Um, there's a saying, um, faster alone, farther together. And I, I say that because at the agency level, when I took office about a year ago, uh, I commenced a review of the OCC's 2020 rule, CRA rule and you know, sought feedback from a, from a wide range of stakeholders. And the overwhelming <laughs> feedback was that the agency should work together and develop a joint rule. And, and that would make the rule uh, better substantively and more durable. And I think that that was something I heard from bankers, from, from community groups, pretty much everybody. Um, more specifically, there were some elements of that rule which were positive that, you know, again, in that kind of feedback process and, you know, and people felt very strongly about them. You know, there was a special section on Native American communities. Um, there was, you know, people talked about the transparency of the eligible activities for community development. There's some disagreement about the exact things on that list, but the concept of having that kind of transparency to speed things up, uh, I you heard a lot about that. Um, and kind of a general embrace of a greater use of metrics, which I think is something we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, though there was lots of criticism about the exact metrics that were picked and how they were used, but the, the idea that you could use, take a data-driven approach and be more objective and consistent. I think these are things that were, you know, was hearing loud and clear. Um, and then I recall very early on, Jesse, we had a discussion, um, you know, I was doing outreach to various groups and you were really you know, clear about, okay, these are some priorities and concerns that we have about great inflation, about you know, a greater need uh, for consistency and performance, things like that. I heard that echoed by some of your members, by others. And so we, through the interagency process, we able to kind of bring all of that to bear uh, on, on the joint uh, proposal, which I think has made it a lot stronger. 
Absolutely. And, and um, Comfort, I'll shoot back to you, sort of if we're successful, um, and there's a long way to go, mm -hmm. uh, the rule is not done, uh, I'm sure there will be uh, hundreds and hundreds of comments issued uh, on the NPR and, and a final rule to come. But if the rule is, is successful, if, uh, if, if we get CRA done in five years from now, 10 years from now, it's a success. What's going to look different uh, in in low and moderate in, income communities? Um, how is the nature of the banking relationship with communities going to change? Right. I think that's the right question to ask because you know we 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 want to be outcomes focused. We're not we're not doing this for the process. We're doing this for the outcomes. Um, so the outcome we want is a fulfillment of the statute's mandate, right? Be, the banks meet the the credit needs. Uh, of the communities in which they operate, especially those of LMI communities. So what does that mean concretely? Well, at a really high level, you know, my expectation is that we're gonna see higher levels of CRA activity. Like the way the rule has been constructed, I think you're gonna see an overall rise in, in the level of activity. I think you're also gonna see better and more impactful activities. Now, you know, Lael had referred to this. We, 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 make spe we go to uh, special, uh, parts to incentivize, you know, um, uh, persistent poverty areas, small businesses, like extra small businesses, disaster preparedness, climate resiliency, like those were specifically kind of crafted and targeted to ensure they don't kind of slip through the cracks, that those are, those are there. Um, and, and finally, like we want faster action. And I think that there have been some kind of referring back to the eligible activities. There were some complaints before, some of them, a lot of them found it that it just took too long. And I think that Part of this process here is that if we can have you know, overall more, better, and faster CRA activities, what you should see is that there's just this stronger feedback loop between communities and banks. So that through that mix of quantitative, qualitative, and that framework, you're getting more financial inclusion, more banking access, more small business development. You know, you go down the list, more affordable housing, more home ownership. Those are all the things that we're, we're striving for. Thank you. Vice Chairman Brainerd, same question. Uh, what, what do you hope will come out of this rule if we're successful? You're on mute, Lyle. Thank you. Um, so I'm hoping um, that when I travel around to communities uh, in different parts of the country, um, where I don't currently see banks investing in those communities, whether it be the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota or Hope, Mississippi, I'm hoping to see the new CRA approach providing incentives uh, to lead to greater banking services, greater credit to small businesses and greater community investments, all of which will make for more vibrant uh, communities. And, you know, we will for the first time have data to identify communities with low levels of community development financing, which would allow us to do an impact assessment of uh, what would the impact of community development investments in that area have. Um, we've also thought a lot about um, the uh, ways that community um, development activities are defined to make sure that you uh, provide CRA credit only when those activities do not displace or exclude low or moderate income residents from low and moderate income communities. That's been an important uh, area that we just haven't had a uh, strong enough uh, screen on. So we propose one. Um, we are trying to provide powerful incentives for investments in affordable housing in those communities, investments in climate resilience for the first time. Um, and so our hope is that those kinds of activities which haven't gotten credit in the past, by giving credit, you'll see more affordable housing, affordable housing that, that is in areas that does not displace, uh, but rather serves low and moderate income residents, investments in climate resilience, for instance, which haven't previously uh, been um, given uh, consideration. These are the kinds of changes uh, that over time we would hope to see. Thank you. I'm gonna ask one more question because this was such a, um, such a process. And, and I feel as though through the process, 
I, I got to know each of you a little better, your values, your commitment to this issue. Um, you know, folks didn't always agree, but as, as uh, Mike said earlier, mm -hmm. Um, coming together, you know, we're, we're, we're going farther together here. Could you talk a little bit about the process that got you here and, and how you hope it will transform the collaboration among the three agencies going forward? It, it occurs to me that this is not just about a rule, but really about how three agencies implement a rule and think about issues, um, you know, in the same way. Um, uh, what would you hope would come out of the interagency collaboration going forward? And I'll, I'll, I'll just see which of you would like to go first on this one. Mike. Uh, sure. So, I, so um, you know, the, the staffs of all three agencies, we each have extremely dedicated, extraordinarily dedicated staff. I mean, this, I think we knew this, I mean, I kind of knew this coming in, but seeing it up close and personal, it is amazing how much experience and how dedicated folks are to making this work. And sometimes those passions uh, uh, manifest in all sorts of ways. And I think the good news here is that there was a very strong desire to kind of achieve that shared objective of strengthening and modernizing the CRA. All the things that Leo mentioned that you know, we've been talking through here, because um, it takes kind of bringing all the different experiences. You know, the OCC has a different set of experiences with CRA uh, than the Fed and the FDIC. And putting them together on the table and kind of working that out with all the different touch points we have with NCRC and others results in a better product. It's not easy uh, by any stretch. But I think one thing that I think going forward, what I'm hoping is that because of that collaboration, that will continue. And that should hopefully result in better consistency. You know, there's, there's a number of parts within uh, the rule that do, there's a lot of quantitative stuff. There's also a lot of qualitative stuff. And I know there's concerns about the discretion and judgment on some of those qualitative parts, but if we do it together, that does tend to lead to convergence and consistency where we can check each other um, on how we're doing that. And I think that that will improve you know, outcomes um, uh, and trust and transparency into the process. So we get to those outcomes in a way that, that are sustainable and durable. Yeah, I'd certainly um, uh, echo um, the, that we're standing on the shoulders of our really outstanding expert staffs, um, but we're also uh, very much um, building a spirit of um, collaboration between the three agencies. You know, we worked uh, very hard to come to agreement on every element of this proposal. We also worked very hard to make sure that we had unanimity within each of the decision-making structures within each of our um, agencies. And I think that is going to make this rulemaking more resilient um, and, and stronger. And uh, in order to achieve consistency, we can't stop with uh, the final rule. I think what we learned as Mike was mentioning, it's very different to do CRA exams for a bank with literally hundreds of assessment areas than it is to do for a bank that is a community bank in rural areas. They're just very different uh, approaches, but we want the banks to be clear that we have the same expectations. And in order to make sure that we really go that last mile in ensuring consistency so the grading is on a level playing field, we're gonna to have to have the staffs of the three agencies working together through the implementation pro uh, process. Um, and of course, a big piece of this is making sure that um, to the extent we're relying on data, we have consistent data collections, we're sharing that data. So we've got a lot of work to do to implement in a consistent way. But I think uh, banks asked for consistency between the three agencies. And they asked for a lot more uh, quantitative metrics. Um, and they certainly get all of that clarity, certainty, and consistency across the agencies by virtue of us just taking the necessary time to really agree with each other and work through those differences. Absolutely. And, and uh, you certainly delivered on that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there will be a variety of opinions about it, but uh, really, really, um, really strong uh, proposed rule. And, and we look forward to engaging uh, on it. Um, 
during the comment period. I want to thank both of you. That's our time for this video. Um, we, we do have uh, Acting Chairman uh, Martin Grunberg will be speaking to the conference and uh, members of the three banking agencies staffs will be discussing the rule in greater detail. I'm sure we could talk for another hour, but uh, we, we wanted to, to give each of you a chance to address the NCRC audience. So thank you once again uh, for your time, for your service, uh, Madam Thanks Vice so Chair and, and, and Acting Comptroller. Thanks so much, Jesse. Thank you.